Hi, thank you very much. Um, I feel very... Um, humbled actually to be here um, as a climate scientist because I'm going to actually talk about things that I feel are completely new to me as a, as a meteorologist but actually um, you guys are all out there doing it all the time and um, I um, have enjoyed working with this community over the last two and a half years and learning um, very, having to learn very fast. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, from a scientist perspective um, how we're going to, how we are trying to really put in place some pragmatic solutions um, system-based solutions um, um, given the context of the, the dual uncertainty of global warming um, and also the lack of skill that we still have um, um, with um, from seasonal forecasting out to now casting um, um, at, uh, at, 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 with African climate we don't have the silver bullet solution at the moment but getting out there and putting structures in place to enable us to learn and understand more about the climate uh, and understand more about vulnerability and understand how we can support the kind of work you do <coughs> is really important to us. So this is going to very touch very briefly on two approaches we've taken and as you referred to, it's two of the sort of platforms that we're um, using. Um, and this is based on a paper that we submitted um, in August last year, oh sorry, was published last year. Um, and the team there represent natural scientists um, from Reading, social scientists as well, um, as well as um, Oxfam um, NGOs and also um, African-based um, um, uh, um, researchers. So um, African communities face extreme weather event on a fairly, typically very regular basis. And th this is um, just showing you the, the, rain, the fluctuation in the total rainfall every monsoon season. And you can see that um, these back-to-back -back extreme events, whether it's drought or whether it's flood, happen on a regular basis. And the SREX reports, um, the, the projections suggest that this is just going to be exacerbated as time goes forward. I've left two, or an orange arrow and a blue arrow there. One marks 1984, very dry year. One marks 1994, which was actually a very wet year. Not the wettest there, but for, this, for Niger, which is what I'm going to focus on. Um, and then notice at the end there, you've got 2010, 2011, 2012, and you guys are all out there dealing with the massive food security um, that was um, crippling the Sahel at that time and also the Horn of Africa. Um, and it's, it's the fact that you've got these competing events. So we really need to be in there trying to do something that we, with given the uncertainties that we are facing. So this is about the work we've been trying to do, um, that we're doing, and about how we make the how we bring the, the, the latest climate science that we have um, and make it available. Um, and I would say that this is the Af Africa Climate Exchange is funded by the Natural Environment Research Council. So I am I'm funded to uh, do this, sit at this science policy interface, which I think is a fantastic um, um, forward step. Sorry, this wasn't not quite wanting to go forwards. So um, I'm going to talk to you about the first platform, which is um, very much this new way of working which um, for us, which is um, sort of flipping research on its head. We're going the other way around. We're going from operations to research. Um, this is not an area we're normally comfortable with, um, especially in terms of getting funding. But we're showing that through getting out there, rolling up our sleeves, listening hard to what's needed, and actually starting with some simple things, we're actually learning new research questions and beginning to build our knowledge um, of the in particular key <coughs> areas, uh, the gaps that, w that, that we have. So it's a really valid um, um, approach to take. Um, and in fact, you can do a lot if you take the systems approach and you bring in the right expertise, plug the gaps. You, you, you're, you're, for example, we're, we were asked to come and support work in Sudan by practical action with issues of of conflict and tensions between the, the farming communities and pastures. Could we develop an early warning system? We sat there and scratched our heads and thought, actually, yes, we can, because we have got some tools available to us, and we're happy to get out there and listen and try and build the structures necessary to support that work. Um, and we've shown that actually just by bringing in the right expertise, and for relatively small amounts of money, um, you can actually make um, substantial differences bringing in the right partnerships and relationships. And through doing something small, you can actually begin to then deliver evidence, show some impact, and that actually then enables you to, to secure um, um, the kind of funding you need for more long-term work. 
So the Rainwatch AFCLICS work um, is, is basically, it's about monitoring the rainfall data. Daily rainfall data is a hugely rich resource. Um, the Rainwatch platform is um, a technical platform that provides real-time monitoring of all those things that are of interest for the communities, the dry spells, the heavy rain events, flooding, supports irrigation planning and management. And it allows you to, insta to, to instantly visualise the evolution of that monsoon season um, as, it, as, it, sorry, as it evolves. Couple that with AFCLIX, which is this, in effect, it's become a bit like a boundary organisation, fairly neutral, coming in and just um, trying to put the right people together to enable um, the solution to move forwards. Um, there's a lot to be gained from actually not understanding so much of the politics and just being able to be a very neutral per people. You can actually bring together people perhaps in that you wouldn't wouldn't normally have come together because you can actually generally say, actually, I, I, I didn't understand those tensions between you guys, but it would be great if we all worked together. There's a huge advantage in that. So that's sort of the role. So this is just um, one output. This is for um, 2011. This is um, looks complex, but actually it's just a simple plot of the total rainfall from the 1st of May to the end of October for 2011 for Niamey. Um, and this output was designed by the Niger government with the Niger Met Service and after discussion with um, around 200 plus farmers. Um, and it's the way that they wanted the information presented to enable them to make decisions. So what we have done is bypassed the the, this Rainwatch platform is, um, in effect, an intelligent computer system that takes in the station, the daily station data, and then outputs it in a form that can be visualised quickly and in real time. That's the important thing. Normally, usually, it can take anything up to two weeks for that station data to be processed and then output. So this was bypassing that. Um, and what it does is that we want the, the plot on your left shows you um, the rainfall against the historical percentiles, and the one on the right shows you against extreme years, the ones that I flagged at the beginning, in fact, and that's what the Niger government wanted to enable them to make decisions. So in 2011, severe drought hit Niger and indeed across the Sahel, um, and the white dots show you the observed rainfall. And this, was this is put out every few days. This is the end of the season plot, but this is coming out all the way along. So they, so the government and the Met Services at that time could see that that rainfall was only hitting, tracking along the 10th percent percentile all the way through that monsoon season. And you can see on the right, 1984 was that very dry year, and you can see the observations were actually up below that at the beginning of that season. So those orange arrows actually mark quite a turning point, not just from the, the physics, but also from the what happened as a result so you've got the rain band that moves, migrates north and then south again. Actually, around about middle of August, even if it rained every single day, if you'd had um, a, um, a very dry season until then, even if it rained every day after that, it's still only going to get up to about 50th, 50th percent percentile. So you still you know in advance that it's going to unfold as a poor monsoon. And that's what happened mid-August. So the Niger government actually alerted and mobilised international aid at that point and that was around about five months ahead of the other Sahel countries as a result of being able to visualise what was actually happening in that monsoon season. Again for 2012, um, I won't dwell on this one but this again shows you that was a wet year um, um, and um, the government and everybody else was well aware of that but again you can see that it, it shows you because you've got these two contrasting ways to visualise um, that you get much greater accessibility of that information. And for our scientists, it was really, it's been really interesting doing this monitoring. And this is where you get that help to, to engage all the communities, um, which you, you need everybody around the table. And for us as scientists, this was interesting because through monitoring, through understanding and, and being able to work with this um, daily data, we found that actually, and we think, and this is new research for us now, that that movement of the rain band offers us some potential new predictability about the seasonal forecast, which we were unaware of before. And we discovered new features about the how that mo rain band moved. It moves very much, it, re moves, it retreats twice as fast as it does advance, which is very interesting. So, um, and it also told us some information about the actual rain systems, but I won't go into that. So, AFCLICS has helped um, 
is now helping us to upscale and extend the work. Um, what we do as an, a boundary organisation is that we um, work very hard, as Saskia said, is about actually getting down, understanding the context, um, understanding the audience that you're working with, how do the people use, um, absorb climate <coughs> information, do they need participatory processes, what do they use, mm -hmm. and working with them. Um, one point I'm just going to pick up very quickly at the end is that um, at to ensure you can achieve impact, you do have to be in it for the long time and you do have to um, engage and stay put. Um, and funding is quite um, difficult because of the three, five year time frames. But, and this is where I want to flag up from something, I think the universities have an important role to play here because outside and between those project times, actually universities can provide, pr provide quite a good role at, at helping to maintain that engagement, whether it's through alumni or whether it's just providing small pockets of money to enable people to keep doing that travelling and to keep being engaged. So I think that's something to flag up, that universities are actually an important partner to, to, to bring in. So we're now working in Sudan, and um, I'm going to leave that because I want to flag up one important point in all the work that we're doing, which is about understanding the chain of information and how to really take the early warning and understand what it, the shape of it, what it should li look like, how often that information should be delivered. You have to have a chain of actors all the way along. And for us, working across the Sahel in fragile states, we found that the community-based organisations and that was a really, really important partners for us to actually kill sort of main be, be, no matter what the change of government is, you can stay on that roller coaster if you're engaged with the CBOs and the NGOs. So um, we, um, we really want to carry on working <laughs> with you guys. And this is just, um, we're scaling up across the Sahel, so we're op working operationally in, Sa in Senegal and Mali and Niger. And in this year, Ghana and Burkina Faso are coming online. Nigeria is coming online. Sudan's coming online. Ethiopia would like to come online, but we're beginning to be stretched rather thin. So um, the crossed hatch lines are actually showing you where we're, it's not just a monitoring platform, but we're actually trying to build in those vertical and horizontal lines of communication um, to reinforce the early warning delivery. Um, so, um, and then I'm just going to flag up very quickly one other innovative platform that we use, which I think is familiar to Accra, is, is the role of serious games. Afclix has a lot of mm. different related projects, but one project um, I'm in very m much involved in is around attribution of those extreme events. Um, it's a huge, um, the important um, area and is also, at the moment, the science is very new um, <coughs> and developing. Um, and it offers, there's all sorts of interesting and difficult questions around um, the societal aspects of attribution um, and policy makers. So trying to understand that, we've worked with the Red Cross Centre and we developed a game and it's called the Cauldron Game climate attribution under loss and damage, risking, observing, and negotiating. And we've played it at the COP in Warsaw, we've played it at the Africa Climate Conference, we've played it with PhD students, we've played it with all sorts of people, and it's very interesting. And we're learning a lot of scientists, and we hope that as the reflect, we have a reflective phase in it as well, um, that um, the, um, the people involved in the game, it also throws up more questions. And people in the game are both farmers, scientists and negotiators and they change their hats and uh, um, enjoy different emotions as they play the game and it does get very heated. <laughs> so a very, very, but a fantastically, brilliantly <laughs> useful way for us to engage with a whole range of actors and for us all to learn from each other. So that's the final one and I'm probably going to leave the summary apart from this one, which s for us, uh, the two bottom ones really, Working across scales as scientists, as NGOs, it's vital and it is possible by putting in place the right sort of strategic partnerships um, and listening to where you can support connections and links. It's very important that we're not in one cycle, that everything is iterative mm -hmm. between those users and producers. And importantly, nobody gets engaged if there isn't mutual benefits and that has to be across the board from the communities to the policymakers to the scientists that you're working with. Um, and then that last point, it's long time frames we're talking about, and there's, uh, I want to flag out that the importance of funders and also the universities and what we can do to support that. So, and I will finish there. <laughs>